So today we're going to have a talk on the forest preserves of Cook County. This is something near and dear to my heart. My dad always took us out. We lived in Palos, and he took us out every Saturday, got us out of mom's hair, and uh, the three kids would just run around in the forest preserves, and that was our playground. Uh, so, uh, and then my older brother became, uh, he would just, we never found Larry, actually. He'd go off in the forest preserves, and... <laughs> He knew them all. He knew every single slough on the southwest uh, suburbs out there. And, um, and then my son actually uh, worked for the Forest Preserves a couple of summers. So I'm a huge fan of Forest Preserves. I'm sure you are as well. Uh, today we're lucky enough to have Elsa Anderson. She's a stewardship program aide with the Forest Preserves of Cook County. Uh, she's been involved in Chicagoland ecological restoration since uh, 2011 focusing on volunteer and youth programming in conservation projects through the Student Conservation Association, which is something that, if you're not familiar with, that's what my son got involved with. Uh, it's If you have teenagers or somebody, you might want to talk to Elsa about that. And also the Friends of the Forest Preserve. Elsa is a PhD candidate at the U of I at Chicago, where she studies urban ecology. Uh, <clears throat> particularly as it relates to biodiversity and ecosystem services in low-income neighborhoods. Uh, Elsa lives in Forest Park with her family, and she uses native plants to landscape her yard. So let's welcome Elsa. Uh, she'll have a presentation and then take your questions. Wonderful. Thank you for the lovely introduction, and thank you for the invitation to come talk to you guys all today. Um, like you said, I'm Elsa. I work with the Forest Preserves of Cook County. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the history of the Forest Preserves, as well as some of the things that we've got going on uh, these days. So I have on good faith, I wasn't here, that this is what the Forest Preserves of Cook County looked like about 14,000 years ago. Um, the middle of the United States was largely glaciated under the Wisconsin ice sheet. And as that sheet re receded, we saw the depositing of very high mineral rich soils that are very deep. Um, you can tell in, by this map that there are only two small parts of Illinois that were not covered by these ice sheets. And a couple things that they have in common is they look a lot different than what we see around here. They actually have some topography where we have fairly um, flat land. I'm sure you're familiar with that. Um, but the Shawnee National Forest and the Driftless Area in Galena are very beautiful. They're kind of classic beautiful landscapes that have some, you know, rolling hills and large rivers and rock, rockscapes. But the forest preserves have very interesting plant communities and I would argue that they also have these iconic landscapes in them. The forest preserves are, uh, like I said, built on this, this soil that was deposited after the receding of the glaciers. And what came in after that was pretty typical um, conifer forest growth. This allowed the buildup of more organic material in the soil because those conifers dropped their needles um, very quickly every year and that is kind of returned to the soil that can then support higher diversity of things on the ground, the herbaceous layer uh, as it were. And this kind of gives way to what we see today is, um, or what we saw I guess before European contact were these landscapes where there was a large amount of herbaceous vegetation and few trees kind of in between. Something more like this is what we would have expected to see in the forest preserves of Cook County before European contact. So why do they have the name forest preserves? Why are the preserves now forest? And this is you know, pretty typical of what you would see, you know, especially driving through some of the areas where we're not doing restoration work. But the, the critical piece here is that Native Americans were managing this landscape long before Europeans showed up here. Um, in about 1500, the population of Native Americans in the, the state of Illinois was much higher than that of Europeans, and they were doing some really intensive land management work. We frequently undermine their ingenuity in thinking about the landscapes because they handled things very differently than, than European agriculture. 
But what they would do is they would light fire to the prairie landscape. And the reason that they would do this is that fire is good for grasses. Fire's not going to let the trees come in. Fire is going to promote that low herbaceous growth that we think of as prairie landscape. And the bison eat the grass. And so the Native Americans, in using fire in the landscape, were welcoming in the food that they so depended on in their, their homelands. So this was a, an incredibly intensive management process. And the plants that we have here in Illinois evolved with that pressure put on by Native American fire setting. The idea of pristine wilderness existing outside of human contact is a myth, right? Human contact as we think of it as being a European influence is not the only contact out there. Native people lived on these lands, they worked these lands, they managed these lands in different ways than we might consider, but we need to think about that as we're thinking about what the, the history and the legacy is of the forest preserves. As we talk about kind of the political preamble to the forest preserves of Cook County, we need to get into some of the, the history of the important players and the, the politics happening both in the United States and in the Chicago region specifically. So in in the late 1800s, Lincoln Park in Chicago was among the first large urban parks set aside. Um, I'm sure you guys have all been to Lincoln Park. It's a beautiful piece of property right on the shoreline of Lake Michigan on the north side. And that was a really good thing. People were really excited about that. The momentum to develop parks was definitely building in the United States. And we were um, supplanted by having the first kind of park city park system by the city of Buffalo, who set up the first public municipal park system in 1868. However, Chicago really was in on the forefront of setting aside high quality green spaces for people to recreate, for the beautiful spaces that they, they provide. And this was thought of in kind of an interesting way. And John Rauch was one of the, the major proponents of this because it promoted public health. Right? If you had a place that you could get away from the, the pressure of city living and the dirty streets of, of the city, it would improve health. If you had a place to relax, it would improve health. Um, so being in contact with, with nature was very much a part of thinking about a holistic existence. And so that kind of gave way to the formation of districts that were going to support park development. And in Chicago, we had three districts at the time. Lincoln, which was the North District, the South, and the West. These weren't going to be consolidated into the Chicago Park District that we know today until after the Great Depression, when financial reasons actually made that happen. But there were a couple people who really opposed this um, system. Uh, two major players in the opposition of this were Jane Adams and uh, Henry Coles, who was a biologist at the University of Chicago at the time. And they thought that these large parks provide great access to only some people, that people who are living close to them or who can afford to get away are going to reap all the benefits without having smaller parks that are accessible to everybody in the city, which is a fair criticism. And these, um, these staunch advocates of kind of a a broader system of smaller parks, neighborhood parks that were within walking distance of everyone in the city really made a lot of ripples in the, the Chicago community as we were thinking about developing our, our system of open space. And so that's an important consideration to make. The city of Boston, in the meantime, really kind of took the cake. They developed a huge park system by which other cities are still measuring their, their land acclimation. In this kind of short period of time, what we're looking at here is the population growth in three cities, Chicago, New York City, and Boston, uh, on the x-axis, the, or the horizontal axis, and park growth here on the y-axis. So Boston is really far and away exceeding park growth from these other two cities. And uh, Chicago didn't take that very well. That was, <laughs> that was really a personal insult that, you know, Boston was creeping on our turf of, you know, being the second city to New York, blowing us all out of the water in terms of park reclamation. And that, that's really what got the, this building the city beautiful movement going on. Um, it was kind of this plan coming out of Boston and feeling like we all needed to rev up our engines and try to catch them and putting aside land for parks. 
So this is Dwight Perkins. He and his pal Jens Jensen were really critical in advocating for land acquisition for the public, but doing it very strategically. And this is how we differentiated ourselves from Boston, is we, following the direction of Dwight Perkins, decided to set aside land that wasn't only space. He wanted to pick the most beautiful, the most diverse, the most iconic landscapes in and around Chicago to protect. And that is how we ended up with this rim of, of parks being proposed, this outer belt of space that today is known as the Forest Preserves of Cook County. You can see it kind of makes this outside edge that, that kind of encompasses all these other little parks in the city. So we have a very deliberate planning of green space in and around Chicago. So they took this to the people and put it to a vote to establish a forest preserve council and of course it got shot down a couple of times and needed some strengthening, some political hubbub. Politics as usual went on um, a little more diplomatically back then I think than today and in 1913 the Forest Preserve District of Cook County was established. Their mission statement was to acquire, restore, and manage lands for the purpose of protecting and preserving open spaces. And they build in this part about being natural wonders, significant prairies for Forests, wetlands, rivers, streams, and other landscapes. So they really take into consideration Dwight Perkins's advocacy for finding high quality spaces, beautiful spaces. And it really was very, very much in foresight. And people loved the forest preserves and recreating in them as they were established. Um, the early days of the Forest Preserve saw a lot of activity, a lot of people using this space for things like camping, horseback riding, picnicking. Um, you can see here in this old design schematic for Thatcher Woods, which is just up in uh, River Forest, that a huge part of it was gonna be you know, baseball fields and play areas and a dance shelter. So they were really um, very much designed to be used by people. And that, that has its benefits, it certainly does. People were out, people were enjoying it, people were reaping those, those benefits of being in contact with nature and getting away from the city. But humans are pretty hard on a landscape. Um, the, you know, these are just a couple of examples of things that happen when we're using land so intensely and not taking care of it. Our rivers and streams became very polluted um, with you know, garbage and refuse ending up in there. We saw these lands as a space where we could you know, utilize large space for things like nuclear missile testing. Um, so this is down in Palos, Site A. It's now a historical site, but it's where the first atomic bomb was tested, built at the University of Chicago and tested in the forest preserves of Cook County. Yeah, um, so, yeah, so it's well, well marked. If you're interested, you can look up the site online. And you know, as this kind of degradation happens, there the laws that are in place get a little bit chiseled away at. So there was a huge issue in uh, 2015 where Palos Park used the forest preserve land to kind of assert itself and annex a certain part of the city. I don't know all the details, but it was messy. And so there was some, some political pushback about this land grab being an issue. Um, so the, the, the effects of humans are felt kind of on multiple spheres here, right? We have things that can be easily cleaned up, like the garbage in the rivers. We have things that are never gonna get cleaned up, like the nuclear testing site. And we have kind of the more emotional or political mess ups that are you know, fraught with their own kinds of, of problems. And in this process, there was also a moratorium on ecological restoration. And this is problematic for a lot of reasons, but primarily what we see is the invasion of invasive species. So invasive species are species that are coming from somewhere else in the world, typically Europe and Asia, but sometimes other parts of the globe as well. And they take a really strong foothold here and grow very, very aggressively. They'll crowd out all the other native plants. Um, some species like buckthorn, which is listed down here, um, will exude a chemical into the soil that not only prevents other things from growing there, but will kill off the seed bank um, and prevent things from growing there far into the future. 
Um, and they have kind of these, these whole systematic effects. You can see kind of from this complex diagram that a lot of things interact with invasive species. And those things that are interacting with them are typically invasive themselves. So we bring over the, the plant from Europe and then to try and control it, we bring over some sort of bug from Europe. But it goes all crazy too. It's like the old woman who swallowed a fly. Invasive species are a really tough problem. And if we don't you know, keep a handle on them, which they weren't at the time, they can get very, very out of control very quickly. Um, a study done in 2010 found that now buckthorn is the most abundant tree in Cook County, where you know it wasn't even here to begin with, and it's out, out, you know, shading out all of the oak trees that would be recruited into the understory. But I'll have some good news in a minute. <laughs> um, the, the good news is right here, I guess, that we have embarked on this new era of ecological stewardship. In 1998, the Friends of the Forest Preserves was founded by a group of concerned citizens who wanted to make sure that the forest preserves were being um, treated, treated with the respect that they need and being cared for in a way that um, the, the land of that value merited. And so these, these citizens who formed Friends of the Forest Preserves were interested in helping not only with the ecological piece of things, but also with the political piece of things, and sitting in on um, commissioners' meetings and making sure that the forest preserves uh, was, were being advocated for and being treated appropriately on the political stage. They were critical in providing legal aid in preventing further land grabs and turning you know, forest preserves into parking lots, because people see big open land and think, how can we develop that? That's kind of our cultural normative thought process. And so the Friends of the Forest Preserves really helps with that as well. They also, in the last several years, have been really critical in improving our access to restoration work across the county. They have crews out um, ranging from high school students during the summer to full-time professional crews going out and doing restoration work all over the, the county. But that's kind of not not enough. We still need to be thinking about restoration work as a paradigm of stewardship, which is responsible use and protection of the environment using both conservation and sustainable practices. So that means protecting what we have, continuing to elevate that level, and getting more people involved because lots of people use these lands and making sure that it is um, a sustainable process moving, moving into the future. So that involves uh, a number of things. One of the things that I think is really interesting is that the forest preserves is still acquiring land. Um, Lois was just telling me the other day about the Riverside Lawn acquisition of this you know, neighborhood that was flooding so badly and the town collapsed because of that, but now is being returned to forest preserve property um, as they you know, take down the houses and allow that area to regrow in an area where the river is telling us Maybe there shouldn't be houses here. But Maybe this is. Before it, it was not. That was a that was a, a slip up right there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> around it is forest preserve. It was municipal zoning, but now that the the municipality has disbanded, the forest preserves is taking that over and um, will continue to kind of piecemeal acquire that land. Um, Actually, it's unincorporated. unincorporated. Thank you for the correction. <laughs> Um, we have another, another system up by Wolf Road Prairie, which is not too far from here. It's over at um, Wolf Road and 31st Street, where they're continuing to acquire land that's on the verge of a prairie that was never, it's a remnant prairie, it was never developed, never plowed under, never agriculture. So that is expanding really high quality habitat in the forest preserve system. Um, a couple of interesting kind of things on this as well. The forest preserves right now stands at about 69,000 acres. That is three times the size of Manhattan. It's about half the size of the city of Chicago. It's bigger than Milwaukee. It's a huge land. It makes up 11% of Cook County's area. No other city in the country, and I, I, I could say the world fairly confidently, but might not be 100%, has that level of green space protected by these kinds of laws under one umbrella organization. So we really have a treasure in our backyard. And we have people who are also treasures in protecting that. Um, this is Victor Gorino. He uh, gave me permission to put his picture up here. He's been the longtime site steward, along with his wife over at Thatcher Woods, which is just up on, in uh, River Forest. Thatcher Woods is one of our larger preserves. It's about 250 contiguous acres 
of space, and it's also a remnant woodland. So very high quality, never cut down or logged or anything like that. Um, but Victor has successfully lobbied to the Board of Commissioners to really increase their protections, increase the money they're throwing at restoration work, and uh, improve the quality of this space into perpetuity. We also have taken a huge effort to return fire to the landscape. Um, we do this using prescribed burns. Um, our director of resource management right now is a huge advocate of using fire as a tool in ecological restoration. So when the conditions are right, they'll go out with a, a drip torch and they'll set fire to the grasses that are there and you know, keep it very controlled and burn down that fuel. This does a couple of really great things for the landscape. First of all, it keeps those invasive species at bay. North American ecosystems are very much distinct in their reliance on fire. Um, there are other areas of the world, but the, the prairie itself is like the number one fire-reliant ecosystem. So as we take out these trees that aren't supposed to be here, we make a lot more space for the, the plants that are supposed to be here. Second of all, there are some species that actually need that fire in order to germinate. It heats up the soil and will help you know, crack the husks of these seeds that are in the seed bank there and um, allow them to, to continue their growth process. We've seen a huge increase in our uh, prescribed burn efforts in the last few years. Um, in the late 90s, just when this was getting started, we were burning less than a, you know, a, a fraction of what McHenry County and uh, Nachusa County were burning. Um, now we're far and away surpassing them in annual burn yields. Um, and this is a really important management tool and it really has beautiful results. We see these very diverse prairies popping back up um, in areas that were previously infested with buckthorn. We see you know, lots of um, different, different species of flowering plants that attract the birds, that attract the butterflies, that attract the insects that we hear so often about them, their populations declining and being decimated. It also keeps our woodlands looking nice. So we also will send prescribed fire through woodlands. Um, because oak trees, which are our primary you know, canopy tree around here, are fire resistant. They can have bark that's up to three, four inches thick that fire moves through there, it doesn't hurt the oaks, and it allows you know, the other um, under, understory trees to, or understory herbaceous vegetation to survive much better in there. Keeps it nice and open, keeps it nice and bright. We've got a lot of other great initiatives happening in the forest preserves that kind of go hand in hand with having healthy ecosystems. We've got over 100 miles of paved trails, which are great for biking and walking and rollerblading and anything you might like to do. And they're, they've got nice vistas on the sides of them too. So it's not just like walking through a corridor of vegetation anymore. You can see riverbanks. You can see you know, through the savanna. You can see this diversity. So there's a really nice kind of feeling to that. We have um, boat rentals and lake and river access. This has been a huge new push, um, especially along the Des Plaines River to get people out on kayaks and canoes. So there now is um, access at Trailside Museum. There are several other takeout points to access the river. Um, and we also have trips that go out that will help you, you know, get in a boat at one end and get out of the boat at the other end and get back to your car, et cetera. Um, we have interactive nature centers and off-leash dog areas for whatever, you know, kind of hobbies you like to have, or if you have you know, little kids, the nature centers are fantastic. And just a few summers ago, we opened up some campgrounds in the forest preserves. It's the first time there's been camping in the forest preserves in like 80 years or something like that. Um, they have cabins, they have tent sites, they have great access to other parts of the, the preserves as well. So I highly recommend looking into the, the camping. There's one in Palis, there's one up north, um, there's one down at San, near Sand Ridge Nature Center. They're, they're fairly spread around the county. Yep. Um, and they're all a little bit different too, so they're, they're worth um, visiting in, in their independent, you know, for their own right as well. But the question still remains, like, where do we go from here? Um, so there's some in interesting information on this, uh, this graph here that shows that restoration practices are fairly well supported by the general public. A lot of people agree with going out and planting seeds and making sure that those native species are here where they're supposed to be. They agree with removing the, the 
invasive trees. They're not so keen on the herbicide or the culling of deer, which are things that we you know, use only, only in very dire situations. Um, but this is, this is encouraging. This means that people recognize the need for informed land management and getting involved and helping with these things is kind of the next step. And I think the other piece that merits um, considering in this kind of comic on the, the right hand side here suggests that we need to think about where this land came from. And remember that people can feel attached to land when it has a story. And it may not be your personal story, but you're here now and you're helping to tell this story and you're helping to give credence to the stories that you're building upon. And so thinking about this land and the, the legacy that it provides is really an important um, way to get people involved and interested in the forest preserves of Cook County moving forward. The next century conservation plan is kind of the official way that we're working on this. This has four components and this was rolled out in uh, 2013 um, to mark the, the 100, 100th anniversary of the Forest Preserve District and what are we going to do with our next 100 years. So we're taking kind of this four part approach that really fits into kind of this idea of sustainability where we need to think about the nature, of course, it's the land that we are are tending, but we also need to think about the people who are involved here and the economy of the area that we're, we're stewarding. Um, so we need to be kind of encouraging these things to work together and taking strong leadership to make sure that these preserves are being managed in an appropriate way from the, the top-down element as well. So this means good things for our future in the forest preserves. It means there's going to be more places to go hiking. There's going to be more places to go boating. There's going to be more habitat for the plants and animals that rely on this ecosystem. Um, I just saw today the reports on the number of monarch butterflies this year being the highest it's been in 25 years, which is fantastic. And that doesn't happen without people caring about it. People are planting milkweed in their yards, they're bringing in caterpillars and chrysalises and raising them. And so that's a really, really awesome thing. Like people do great things when they care about them. And so helping to protect the forest preserves and, and steward that land is really uh, an Im important mission. Um, the other thing that I think that it allows us to do is really take advantage of what's out there and making sure we're utilizing the space. So if you guys haven't seen this yet, this is the interactive map that they just rolled out at the beginning of this summer for the Forest Preserve District. Um, this is just a screenshot of what's near here, but there's a couple of great things. Um, if you look, we're kind of right, that thing's not coming on. We're right in this corner, you know, Harlem and Pershing thereabouts. Um, but the Cermic Family Aquatic Center is one of the forest preserve pool systems um, within a, a short bike ride or ride from here. There's also a lot of great hiking and biking trails. The Salt Creek Trail is this red system that runs through not too far from here. Um, but this map allows you to put in where you are or it can even if you're on your phone auto detect your location and tell you what's within a certain distance of, of your location. If you're interested in you know kind of getting a nature fix and uh, the forest preserves usually have you covered. I also want to make the, the shameless plug that we could always use more help. We have an incredible group of volunteers who come out and do environmental restoration and ecological stewardship for us. This includes all sorts of different things. It includes taking down invasive species and burning them in big, beautiful brush pile burns. Um, it includes collecting native seeds, especially this time of year when things are ripe and ready to go. Um, making sure that those seeds get taken in and we clear off all the chaff to give the seed the best chance of survival and we either put them back at the site they were collected or we move them on to a new site that we're working on building diversity at. Um, it's a great way to get involved, to get active, to meet some new people who are interested in similar things. Um, we also are always looking for people to help with kind of the, the other end of the supporting that mission. So sending out the emails or baking cookies or doing social media work. Um, we have something that is available for everybody. But the point is that the forest preserves are really a tremendous opportunity for all of us to, to get involved for for activities as well as recreation and volunteering and giving back. Um, with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. And uh, thank you all for coming.
have a question, I'll give you the uh, microphone for the video. Oh, that was a wave. Here's a question. I don't need a microphone. Where does I think the, it records it for oh, the... That's right. The, that's right. It's for the, for the video. So hopefully this yeah. is done. Where does the Forest Preserve get their money to do all the restoration work and things? So that's a really great question. Um, some of it is, does come from the taxpayers. A lot of it also is by individual restoration groups of volunteers writing grants. Um, so we have support from all sorts of, you know, small organizations, larger organizations that fund these kinds of projects, and um, the, those are kind of spread out as as the groups have found them. And I, um, this, uh, can you hear? Or, it, it, oh, it does. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, this isn't a question. It's a it's a plug. Great presentation. Thank I you. Appreciate that. Um, I'm in the uh, Des Plaines River Valley uh, Restoration Project, oh, one of the volunteer networks that she was mentioning, and, and we do a lot of the local um, uh, work on a lot of the sites um, nearby in Riverside. Um, and just to give you an example, which is kind of fun, um, Riverside Presbyterian Church over here on the fifth Sunday of September, so this September 30th, instead of going to church, we're going over to Airy Crown and doing restoration That's workshop. awesome. <laughs> I'm Dr. Diane Ballen. We should have met years ago, but you weren't born yet. <laughs> I was a founding member of Chicago Audubon Society, part of the big fight oh, on the Wolf Road Prairie yeah. that, there with Westchester, and you'll see my name on a lot of bricks as yes. we donated money. And <laughs> our kids from RB went out there and, you know, all the kind of work. Excellent. And, uh, you know, been, been in the trenches for more years than I ever want to recount. I <laughs> started when I was 22, so I had a fight, you know, right. long time. And Freeze and all the work he did about opening up the rivers to people because yeah. we were canoeists too. So know a lot about that. Really love the fact that there are paved trails in the Forest Reserve. Yes. I remember the muddy and all that, yes. payless and everything else. Yep. My question now is because I really love to do the Salt Creek Trail here. Having some trouble with the condition of the trail and the paving of the trail, and although they put, you know, little traffic lights and you hit the button, they're supposed to stop, they don't. Yeah. Right turn on red at 22nd Street. Yes. And LaGrange <laughs> Road. Uh, two days ago, I almost got killed again. Oh, My husband was in front of me, I was about four bike lanes behind. Oof. I'm saying coming through, coming through, two cars stopped, one almost got me. So uh, we're having real problems. How do you work with the cities and signage about no turn on red when pedestrians are present? There is a sign there about a bike, yeah. but without that sign, people are turning right in front right. of bicycles and people pushing strollers, crossing certain intersections, and also the excess when a path intersects it, the buckthorn is so thick you can't see people coming. Yeah. And that's a real issue on 26th Street. Yeah, so, we've brought, bro brought that particular issue up from our end of things. Like, can they please get us some, some targeted places where we could get volunteers out to take care of that buckthorn and make it a priority? Um, the, as far as the... It's, it, it wouldn't... That's not the only way to solve the issue. That's from my, my position in volunteer resources, that's really all the all the power that we have when it comes to that particular piece, you know, the, the, it's a government agency, so we have a lot of, well, a lot of bureaucracy, but, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I know that's a problem because it is. the water and all that going on. Right. The access, um, I, I was a trail watch person for mm -hmm. a lot of years too, and I did make some suggestions in places. Delighted the fact that Forest Reserve responded and those places were taken care of. Yeah. Like big signs that means that when you tried to turn a corner, there was a Forest Reserve sign at 22nd <laughs> Street in LaGrange versus a place where your bike could go through. Yeah. That was removed. So I've been pleased with the response, but I no longer have a connection when you have suggestions, especially when municipals have to be the one with a sign. How is the best way to... Yeah, so I am not a good point person for that, and I could put you in touch with somebody who would be. If you want to send me an email, I'd be happy to, to do that. Just make that connection for you. Yeah. So. Anybody else? Uh, yeah. Yes. 
Thank you for your presentation. That was lovely. You're welcome. Um, and informative. Um, and so you're the one who brought up about shooting deer. Um, <laughs> our question in, you know, in Riverside, and I'm, I don't think I'm speaking alone, um, I feel like we need to call the deer. I feel like DuPage County does a better job of that than Cook County do. does. Yeah. Um, it's been done quietly in late November on a regular basis, but I don't know that it's been done enough. And the population here is is yeah. just jumping ahead yeah. of what I, I definitely agree with you. I mean, personally, handle. outside of my role as the Forest Preserve, I'm I am 100% on board with that. I, I do know that they have quite a few logistical things that they have to deal with, um, and it depends on the individual township and how they can approach culling deer at the township level. And so it's, it's very much a, a political discussion, which unfortunately is, is not the answer you want. Yes. Yes. Right. More, a more uh, intense effort. Yes. But, but Tony's doing a fabulous job. <laughs> I had to deal with all predecessors. Yeah. Yeah. Things have been much improved. Yep. We have another question. Okay. Are you familiar with the conservation at home program? Um, only very superficially, but I have heard of it and I have heard good things about it. So I think a lot of the Frederick Law Olmsted Society members would be very interested. It's a program where you can get your home certified if you're ecologically managing it, mm -hmm. if you're planting native species. It takes a while to get into the system to get the process started. I hope to get certified at the end of this month. Great. So I think a lot of other yeah. families in Riverside would be interested yeah, as well. Yeah, absolutely. I know that's run through the University of Illinois Extension. Right. So um. Um, we love the Forest Preserve. We've raised our kids in the Forest Preserve, so we, we were real excited about this presentation. So thank you. Yeah. Um, I have a question. We went kayaking mm -hmm. on the Salt Creek. Yeah. And it was, you know, the yeah. water quality was about what I expected, but there was one section of it that was just really kind of, it seemed like something was going on there. And, in a um, good way? No. Okay. <laughs> and um, I mean, threat. <laughs> no, no. And I'm just curious. And there almost seemed like there were mussels on some uh -huh. of the. And I don't know that we have zebra mussels there, or if they be they're small. But um, if we have questions that there's, you know, something maybe this discharge in the creek that shouldn't be there or whatever, who would you call? So we do have an ecology staff. Um, at the forest preserves and getting a hold of them would be kind of the first first step because they would follow up on that and then they would bring in you know any sort of contractors to do testing or to do remediation or you know the legal team to, to address it. Um, so could you uh, like email the just yeah. go to Cook yep. County Forest Preserve? Okay. Yeah the ecology staff would be the okay. first place Great. to start for that. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, we, we hike the preserves year-round and we love hiking if there's a snowfall. Mm -hmm. And I understand that the, the preserve, the, the forest preserve can't snow plow every, every right. possible parking lot just because it's probably not you know, economically right. feasible. But is there a way that on the website you guys could list, hey, you know, we've, we've, we've plowed, the, these lots are plowed and open. That's a really interesting because idea. Because I, I called last year and I, they, and they acted like they I was from know. Mars. I was like, they're like, <laughs> what? What do you want? And they're like, just, they were like, just go here. Yeah. 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 So if, the, if there's yeah, a way, a really I, good, I would think that would be easy enough idea. to just throw on the website, hey, we're going to do these 10, these 10 lots are plowed right, right now. You know, so if you want to park, these are 10 access yeah, points. Yeah, that's that, a great idea. I'll definitely pass that thank on you. to the, yeah, the people one who. One more question. You know. I think it'll go to Lois. <laughs> Hi. Okay. Um, you were mentioning something about stewardship, mm -hmm. and folks here may or may not know, but pretend I don't know, could you tell what yeah. that is? Because that's another opportunity Absolutely. for people to really get involved, like this uh, gentleman you were pointing out in the yeah. slide earlier. So stewardship is kind of our blanket term for anyone who's directly acting to benefit the land that the forest preserves. Um, we have volunteer stewards who go through extensive training and they you know, take on a site that they, many of them will, will work for 
you know, decades, and they bring in volunteers and they have the volunteers do things like cut buckthorn or collect seeds um, or you know, planting plants that they've grown to stabilize a riverbank. So this is, this is a huge effort done by volunteers in order to support the nature in the forest preserves and to make it better habitat for the plants and animals that are there, higher quality, um, nature for, for visitors to see. Um, it's similar to some of the work that Lois was telling me you guys do around here along the riverbank, um, removing invasive species, planting, things like that. Um, we call it stewardship though because we want to make sure that it's not just the in the moment restoration activity, right? It's, a, it's a, a mindset of thinking about the forest preserves as something that we need to care for and something that we need to invest in with our time, with our resources, with our knowledge um, in order to preserve moving forward. So we have volunteer groups out um, pretty much every weekend around the forest preserves. You can find the information on our website. Um, if you're interested in joining us, we'd, uh, we'd always love to have more people. I want to thank Elsa again. I, I think she'll stay around a couple yeah, minutes yeah, if people have individual bit. questions. So let's give her another round of applause.